All right. Um, last uh, talk of the day. Um, really, really happy to be here. Really happy to see so many of you guys here. Um, I can imagine you're probably tired. We've had this is the 11th talk of the day, um, but I hope to make it worthwhile for you. Um, so by the end of this talk, um, you'll know how to train or fine tune a large language model probably faster and cheaper than many of you thought possible before this. So uh, I'll give you a bit of background if this clicker works. Yes. Uh, so this is me, slightly older picture. Um, I work as a machine learning consultant. I have my own company. I have been working in this field for almost 10 years now. Uh, I specialize in machine learning with text data. When I say NLP, people tend to think of large language models. This is one of those cases, but I also work with more traditional um, machine learning. So I help um, people or businesses um, with uh, machine learning, and I was approached um, by this guy one day, Ole Stanberg, who is a director and artist as in, at, at an art collective called Salorenta and the Wilder. And um, he writes and creates theatrical performances or art performances. And he basically told me that he wanted an AI assistant that was inspired by his own work. And I was like, oh, this is a lot of, you know, th this, is, this is quite a lot. So basically what he wanted was something that could capture the tonality of his texts or his previous works, um, capture the topics as well, so basically know about what topics he tends to write about. Uh, and it's also, also something that he could put in new material in. Like, for example, if he wants to be inspired by a book, he should be able to just put that book in there and basically train the model based on that. Um, so this is not a small ask. So we started breaking it down. And uh, the idea to start off with, to see if this basically works, is to take all of his previous works, that is like um, performances, descriptions of scenes, I'll show you some of the data later, um, but also kind of maybe even his, his diaries or like newspaper, uh, newsletters that he's written and so on, and capture all of his data basically and try to model on that. And he should be able to prompt it to get inspiration. Um, in this case, you're prompted with a short description and he gets a short description out of the model. Can you see that? Yeah, I think you can. Um, okay, but this is static. So what we wanted to do as well was just to be able to continuously update this with new material. So this was basically the goal. Um, the goal was to have both his previous work um, as well as some, uh, some new ideas, um, some, some books, so like inspiration material and so on that he wanted to use, and then train a model on that. And also, it's obviously very, very important here that it's easy for him to upload new material. All right, so you've probably seen a slide like this uh, a couple of times now. Um, this is log scale, um, as you might be able to see. And when we were doing this, and when we started this project, uh, this started in February last year. So this was in NLP terms quite a long time ago. Um, we decided that larger is better. And we went for GPDJ. Back then, it was the largest GPT model, I should say. Not the largest, but GPT open source model. So February last year. Um, it had been released a couple of uh, years earlier, and it's trained on English um, only. So, uh, as I said, uh, GPTJ uh, de developed by a kind of a small community called uh, Eleuther AI. They are, or at least have been, trying to be a, an alternative to, to open AI. And they are doing a lot of different types of research. Uh, they have data, for example, which is trying on the pile uh, that is 
uh, an open source uh, language modeling data set. The model um, is 6 billion, 6.7, so I usually say 7 billion parameter model. Um, autoregressive text generation model. Um, so, in order to fine tune this, um, back then you needed to use um, JAX or their own version of JAX, which is called Mesh Transformer JAX. I don't know how many of you are familiar with JAX. Uh, I see a couple of nodding faces, but I think most people are not nodding. I saw a hand there, but it was just one hand. Uh, it's not super commonly used. Um, and I think the reason for that is that it is uh, heavily like, research-based. Um, and it's a deep learning framework, uh, very similar to PyTorch, uh, but developed by Google. Um, and it is a research project. Uh, there are, as, as they say, some bugs and some sharp edges in this, uh, which is not great if you want to continuously train something. But we started out with this. Um, now, the GPTJ had been trained using a JAX, or their own version of JAX, um, and it had been trained on TPUs. So TPUs, for those who don't know, it's also a Google product. Uh, it stands for Tensor Processing Units. And you can see it as like GPUs on steroids. Um, the, the idea is basically that it's, it's something that is um, kind of made to be used um, for machine learning. It does very, very efficient matrix operations. Uh, the downside is that it is quite expensive. Uh, or, or those like TPUs to use them is quite expensive. And back in 2022, the um, version of the software that I had to use was an alpha, which also isn't great if you want to do something continuously. Um, fortunately, um, we applied to this product um, uh, to, to, we applied with this product to TPU Research um, Cloud. Uh, it's basically a way for like researchers or research-like research products. This is an art project, so it's quite similar in that sense. Uh, so we applied there. Uh, we got a lot of free credits. Uh, if you're interested, um, I th if you're interested in playing around with TPUs, I think you should apply. Uh, we got half a million Swedish crowns in credits. So you can train very, very large models on them. Uh, and I think these days the software is actually better. Back then it was very, very unstable. Uh, sometimes I would have to just keep the TPU on even though I wasn't training anything because I realized that turning it off meant that everything just disappeared. Um, So, um, let's look at some of the data that we have. Uh, we have two categories of data, basically. Um, one is what we call like data with prompts. Um, so, in this case, for example, uh, to the left, we have a very, very short description of a theatrical play. Um, and to the right, we have a description of a scene. Uh, and then, what we did with, the, with this is fairly simple. You know, you just add the prompt as well as like an end of text uh, token as well. And then we have some other uh, data, data without prompts, that I think is really the, the interesting uh, data here because it's just free-flowing text. Uh, so you can hear, see here, I don't know exactly if you can read this, but it basically describes early in the morning uh, it's, a, it's a very kind of descriptive. You get a feeling for the stylistic um, way, basically the way that this director um, writes. So it's very important that this type of data is in the model as well. Um, so in total, we had only about 200 pages of text. So think a short book, basically. 
Um, 190 of those short descriptions, 183 scenes, uh, but most of this was this type of like free flowing text. Um, so as I said, not a lot of data. Um, I'll show you later what you can do with a little more data. So uh, some results here. I'll show you some, some iterations. Uh, the first one is quite funny. It just talks about performances and performances and performances. It was obviously very overfitted. Um, another example was that in the end, it adds some fake Danish. It was quite funny. In, in this case, we uh, added some more data because we realized that this doesn't work. I think it picked up some Swedish words and thought they were Danish. And this is a small set, a tiny set of Danish data. And this, I'm not sure. Um, so uh, we finally got to something that is fairly good, but a little bit repetitive in this case. Very, very short sentences and so on. Um, and in the end, we got to something that actually captures like both the tonality as well as like the topics fairly well. Um, and it's funny because I was. You know, obviously, there is no. Um, there is. It's very, very hard to test these things, right? I mean, it's basically like, does this make sense to the director? Well, then it's right, right? And I was asking him, you know, how is it to actually prompt this model? And he says that it's like talking to yourself, but a slightly weirder version of yourself. And I felt that that kind of like accomplished what we wanted to do. That. Let's see. There we go. Now, here's the thing, and this is what I basically was promising you. We didn't want to have the static model. The static model works well, um, but it's not that interesting, you know, if it only outputs similar things. But instead, we wanted to continuously update this, and we realized that we needed to get rid of both jacks and TPUs. Um, if we wanted to, to be able to do this. Um, so instead, uh, we started using DeepSpeed instead. Um, and DeepSpeed is developed by Microsoft. Uh, it's a little bit of my Microsoft in this case, but yeah. Um, it has three pillars, as they call it. Uh, training, uh, inference, and compression of models, so think quantization. Uh, it uses GPUs and not TPUs, which is exactly what we were looking for. Uh, and then it has the zero redundancy optimizer, um, which is basically a set of optimization, op optimization strategies that are based on data parallelization. Um, it is a framework, uh, and it wraps quite nicely around the code as well. Um, so it's slightly like out of the box feeling, which is really really nice. It also does offload some of the uh, some of the training to the CPU. Um, so if you are kind of short on VROM, then it can be quite nice to use. Um, so in terms of hardware, uh, we're using Google Cloud for this. Uh, in France. Uh, a Tesla V100, uh, for reference, that's about $3 an hour. Um, and it has 16 gigabytes of, um, of GPU ROM. Um, now, for training, we were forced to use two A100s. Um, it took us a while to actually get access to these from Google, but now, finally, we do. Uh, they're eight, uh, 40 gigabytes each, so 80 gigabytes in total. Uh, the funny thing is that 40 gigabytes of RAM uh, or GPU RAM is actually enough, but the problem is the the, the RAM, the like usual RAM, not GPU RAM, is not enough for what you get with just um, one GPU. And this is only a um, Google Cloud specific thing, um, so we actually had to size up. But it's fine because it's still so it takes basically no time at all to train a model. So here I have an example. As I said, two Tesla A100s. Uh, they're almost $6 hourly. And if we say that we have 1,000 pages 
of data. I, I did a little benchmark using a thousand pages. So you put a couple of books in there and so on. Uh, for reference, that's also equal to, if you want to do prompting, that's equal to about 15,000 samples, which is a quite sizable amount of data. Uh, it takes about eight minutes to train one epoch, and the total cost is less than a dollar. And I think that's pretty cool to go from, you know, using TPUs um, that are quite expensive, hard to set up, into this and being able to fine-tune a model for less than one dollar, and in eight minutes. So, some conclusions. I'll skip the first line. Um, stability matters. Obviously, if you want to do things, something continuously and you want things to work flawlessly, you need to work with stable products and not research products. And Something that I think is interesting is for the first model that we used, we're still, we were still only using 200 pages of, of text. That's not a lot of data. As I said, it's, it's equivalent to a short book, basically. And I think it's, it's really, really nice to see how well the model actually captures like the topics and the tonality, even though it's quite small. And that is because we're using a fairly large language model, and they generalize much, much better. And yeah, in general, fine-tuning can be fairly cheap. Um, and since uh, this is an art product or a theatrical product, um, there has been a play written by, by this model, or rather by the director and the model um, in unison. Um, and it's called Tosspot. Uh, it's going to premiere in uh, I think late November at Dunsons Hoofs in Stockholm, um, and I've seen, I've seen kind of some, uh, um, yeah, so, some short basic scenes from this, and uh, it's it's very very interesting. I can basically see you know where these, this this is coming from, uh, so it's super exciting. I think this will be Sweden's first theatrical play based on AI. Um, so yeah. Um, with that, thank you. Um, if you want to talk to me, um, you can add me on LinkedIn. That's my QR code. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. So, do we have any questions? Uh, I was actually wondering what was the fine tuning objective? How do you mean? Uh, yeah, so, so uh, basically, like similar to um, similar to how the model was uh, was trained previously. So basically, you do when you, we did fine tuning in this case, it was basically similar. Like um, it was a cross cross entropy loss, I believe, in this case. Uh, but it's the same as DPJJ was uh, fine tuned on uh, was trained on originally. Okay, so it's just predicting next token. Yes, exactly. Okay, okay so it's exactly. a continuation of the pretext task. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, question over there. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I was just wondering, how did you migrate the model from JAX to the Microsoft framework? Good, uh, good question. Uh, it wasn't me, it was Hugging Face. Um, so when we started out, they were, um, they hadn't ported the model yet, uh, which is why we were forced to using uh, JAX and so on. Um, but now, you know, this is an open source model. Uh, you can find the weights on Hugging Face. Uh, so we ended up using the Hugging Face weights instead, uh, instead of porting it ourselves. Yeah. Uh, Any more? more? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure. How many epochs did you have to train on? Is that the difference oh, between the different iterations? Um, yes, yeah, so, so that was one of the things we re realized in the end, it was just one epoch. Uh, the, the first one, I think, I believe I trained 10 epochs, and that's when it became super like, overfitted. Uh, so in general, we realized that it, like, by just training it one epoch, it actually learned really, really well. And I think in general, you know, if you want to, if you want to fine tune for text generation, like creative texts, I, th I do think think that one epoch is usually enough. You capture it very well with that. Yeah. That sounds reasonable. Yeah. Okay, one more. Yes. 
I'm, I'm curious who's going to ask about why we didn't use OpenAI for this. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, great presentation, really, really interesting. I'm curious, what other kind of applications do you see for this? Uh, that is a really good. Uh, that is a really good question. I mean, I think. I think it's it's funny now. I mean, we have we have an open AI. We have open AI and and start tuning, and you know that is quite different. I think. Um, I think it's the interesting part with this is just having basically all your data. Uh, fed into one model, as well as the data that, he, that you might want to get inspired on. So I think that it's like, I mean, for anyone writing a novel, I think it's really, really interesting. Uh, I think basically for all types of like creative work, even uh, for things like writing emails, if you just feed all your emails into one model, you know what can happen. There might be better models for that. Uh, so I think specifically like creative sorry, creative work, um, and, and where you write a lot of texts and so on. I tend to believe a lot that uh, um, fine-tuned models or like models specifically trained for one task or with specific data can perform much, much better than general models if you know how to use them. So, so that's why I think it's interesting. Did we have another question in front here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you said that the artist wanted to fine tune this model multiple times depending on like new things and new books that they read, right? Yes, exactly. How did you make that available to the artist? So uh, we have a Google Drive uh, folder that he uploads material to. And then um, I basically read that um, from the um, container. In, uh, uh, or from the, the VM in Google Cloud. Uh, so I take, uh, take all the data, train the model on, and then uh, make it available in the model repository. Uh, so it's, it's, we wanted to have a drag and drop solution, and Google Drive tends to work really, really well for that, and we were all kind of in the Google framework anyway. Thank you. So one final question over there. Yeah. Uh, hey, thanks for, for the presentation, very interesting. I have a question regarding the training infrastructure, because this problem that you said about not having enough RAM, but uh, you know, uh, enough RAM, but having enough VRAM is yeah. something that I have faced it into. Yeah. And we are using Azure, but you say that you use it to 8100. Yeah. Uh, where did you find that instance? Because right now the only, a100 instance that is uh, available, it has eight GPUs, which is too much for what I want, actually. The, so yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, so is this Azure specific? Because on Google Cloud, you can definitely specify like how many. I mean, you can pick like one, two, four, and yeah. eight A100s. But, but did you train it then in, in Google Cloud, not in? Uh, yes. Uh, ah, OK, so it, Microsoft was just the deep speed framework, right? Y yes, sorry. Okay. We, so we didn't. Yes, that that is that is correct. So we're still training this on Google Cloud, um, but we are using a lot of uh, Microsoft. Uh, um, yeah, DeepSpeed, for example, is one Microsoft solution. Uh, so so yes, you are uh, you're right. It's Google Cloud. Uh, I did look into Azure uh, when I didn't get access to the A100 so quickly, um, and I noticed that as well that it's you get eight straight away. Thank you, Kaisa. Thank, Thank you. you.